Today's scripture reading is in Matthew 16, 13 through 20. If you all stand with me as we read from God's word. In your pew Bible, that's page 976. It's Matthew 16, 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district, Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they say, or they, and they said, Some say John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should not tell or should tell no one that he was the Christ. Thank you, brother. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the glimpses and foretaste of heaven that you give us on this side. I thank you, Lord, for the way that you created us created us for the deepest satisfaction we could ever have in our lives to be found in a relationship with our Creator and our Savior through Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and rose again. You created us to worship you. And when we do, Lord, it is, it is a blessing and glory and honor to your name and it is a blessing and a fulfillment to our hearts. Lord, thank you for letting us taste and see. And help us now, so long as we live, until we enter that place of eternal glory, help us to live our days here in reverence and fear of the Lord and holiness and truth and love and faith and in obedience to you. That we might know you well and that we might share the love of God that is found only in Jesus Christ with a dying and lost world with the very life that you've given us. Bless us, I pray, to be your church in Jesus' name, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal, creator and savior God. I pray. Amen. You may be seated. We've been going through a series uh, playing on the words got milk, uh, God milk, and uh, with, the, with the focus from uh, Peter when he says, crave the pure spiritual milk of the word of God so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. This is the final sermon uh, that one of us will give. We've been uh, sharing messages, uh, Pastor Evan and myself taking turns. And so next couple of weeks, we'll come back to he and I doing a couple sermons together from the front, like the same way we started this. And so uh, here we are in the final uh, individual message on the church, Marks of a New Testament Church, the true church making the gospel visible is the title of my message today. And I, I think I have a slide, one of the first slides um, is just a picture of all the messages we've been through this summer. Uh, we took time this summer to focus on, on growing in Christ, growing in God, in the ways that God gave us. He, God himself, through his word, teaches us ways that he wants us to draw near to him. Um, these are, are all of his grace 
These are all of his goodness. These are all means by which he speaks to us and we speak back to him. Uh, Scripture intake was the first message uh, and personally encouraging people to read your Bibles, uh, to study God's word. Um, I cannot encourage you enough to read the word of God for yourself. Have a goal in your life, whether it's read the entire Bible every year or read the New Testament in the next uh, three months or six months. Uh, uh, different people have different plans. Uh, the, the worst plan you could have is just not reading it. Pick a plan and read God's Word. Uh, and then we had a message on why we do expository preaching and teaching, to go through God's Word also in the church, as a church, book by book, which is what we primarily do. Uh, this spring we went through First Timothy. This fall when we're done with this series, we're going to go through Second Timothy as a church, beginning of the book to the end of the book. I'm telling you, that is, in my life and experience, it's not only biblical, uh, as Paul tells Timothy to preach the Word, uh, it is also the most fruitful way of studying God's Word together. And there's so many reasons why. It, one of the primary reasons is, is it doesn't allow, whether it's an individual pastor, preacher, or teacher, or even a church as a whole, it does not allow us to get off track of God's Word and have hobby horse, you know, focuses or agendas or anything like that. Because God's Word itself is going to be our guide our authority. It is our truth. The Word of God endures forever. Heaven and earth will pass away. So the Word of God is all sufficient for everything in our lives. And the more that we align our lives individually and the church corporately to what the Bible teaches, I actually literally have the faith and belief we will be blessed more by God Himself because we'll be doing it His way expository preaching, and then your personal prayer life, praying together, stewardship and kingdom stewardship, a personal testimony, and then marks of a New Testament church. So why would I be going through marks of a New Testament church? How does that parallel with personal testimony and a person's testimony? Well, actually, it does very well because it's essentially, we could call it corporate testimony. Uh, we know that there's, I mean, <clears throat> how, how much do I have to go into uh, there are false churches. There are false groups of people out there who claim to be followers of God, and they simply are not. Uh, there are those who are false who uh, do not even call themselves Christian. They might be a different religion. Uh, but there are those who are false who claim to be Christian. So what is a true New Testament church? And, and, and what's its purpose? What is it for? And we're going to talk about that today. The true church making the gospel visible. Uh, Mark Deaver, in his book, Nine Marks of a Healthy Church, uh, lists, guess how many elements of a healthy church? Nine. It's in the title. Yeah, excellent. Well done. Um, nine marks of a healthy church. Expository preaching, biblical theology, the gospel, a biblical understanding of conversion, a biblical understanding of evangelism, a biblical understanding of church membership, Biblical church discipline, a concern for discipleship and growth, biblical church leadership, nine marks. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go through um, two marks today, which I think are the two most important. And actually, there's three points to the sermon, and the first sermon, is, the first point is going to be, yeah, first sermon. <laughs> the first point is defining church. We're going to define church, and then we're going to talk about the two most important marks of a church. Um, there are other marks in Scripture as well, but what marks a church being a true church versus these false expressions that might be out there? Uh, and how important it is for our testimony about who we believe in, what we believe, who we follow. These things ought to be absolutely essential and important to us because as we read uh, a couple weeks ago from Acts 20, verse 28, this is Paul speaking to the Ephesian church. Uh, his, his farewell speech he has with them as he's about to leave them. And towards the end of it, he says, Be on your guard yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. That which Jesus purchased at so great an expense 
So great a love, greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for his friends. That which Jesus valued and purchased ought to also be valuable to us. And as we go through the message today, there's a, you know, just a couple of things I want us to keep in mind. Uh, the purpose of the message today is to faithfully and obediently live out the gospel via the marks of God's true church. Faithfully and obediently living out the gospel via the God-given marks of a true New Testament church. And I want to encourage you, by way of a little bit of a, of a, of a gentle challenge at the beginning, I just want to encourage you be careful how you think of the church of Jesus Christ. To any extent that we belittle the church or criticize the church, to any extent, and, and, and you know, I know that there's plenty of discussion about it <laughs> all around us. And sometimes people find themselves in discussions that um, maybe are about denominational backgrounds or that particular church over there that has a particular reputation or, you know, I'm trying to be kind of generalistic without lambasting something, okay? But wait a second, wait a second. Where's the true church? To any extent that we belittle the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we actually belittle Him. Because He purchased the church with His blood. Let us be more careful with our speech about his church. And let us be more honoring of the thing that Jesus found so valuable, his bride. Gene Getz, in a book titled The Measure of a Church, he goes through uh, from the book of Acts to the epistles in the New Testament, and he categorizes uh, every time the word church is used in those scriptures from Acts throughout the rest of the whole Bible. And he categorizes them, and, and by the way, I have this, I can make it available to you if you'd like to see it. Uh, uh, whenever a biblical reference for the word church refers to the universal church, or whenever it refers to a group of local churches, like to the churches in Galatia, or whenever a specific use in the Bible refers to a local church, a single local church. From Acts to the end of your Bible, the word church is used to refer to the universal church 20 times. From Acts to the end of your Bible, the word church or churches is used to refer to a group of churches 34 times. From Acts to the end of your Bible, the word church is used to refer to a specific local congregation 48 times. There is a misunderstanding of the concept of God's church uh, as it is rightly taught in Scripture. And there's a misunderstanding that, um, and a lot of it just comes with maybe our church history and denominationalism and things like that, but let's not major on the negatives. Let's major on what God's Word teaches and some people pit sometimes the universal church against the local church. And biblically, that ought not be done. There is such a thing as the universal church. The scriptures speak both of what may be called the universal church of Christ, made up of all believers throughout all time and all places. So Peter who's gone on to be with the Lord, and Paul, who've gone on to be with the Lord, Hebrews chapter 11, all those who by faith, even Old Testament saints, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, they are part of the universal church. Uh, believers yet to believe in the years to come, so long as the Lord may tarry and before he returns, those who come to believe in Jesus Christ are part of the universal church. So I think the misnomer sometimes, the misunderstanding sometimes is people think, well, all the universal church is is all the local churches added together. You add up all the local churches and you get the big church. That's actually not biblical. Because the church, universal, is made up of all believers in all places, in all ages, in all eons, in all times who are the Lord's, purchased by His blood. I think Millard Erickson gets it right. He's a systematic theologian. It's one, it's, he's one of the guys that uh, 
It's one of the key texts we use in seminary, for example. Millard Erickson. Uh, As the scriptures speak of both what we can call the universal church, it also speaks of the local congregations of believers identifiable in different places. Erickson writes, we should note that the individual congregation or group of believers in a specific place, that is the local church, is never regarded as only a part or component of the whole church. The church is not a sum or composite of the individual local groups. Instead, the whole church is found in each place. I think that's more biblical. Why? We're going to explain that this morning. We're going to go through that this morning. And and let me share with you why, by way of an illustration. I think that some of the single most important things that will ever happen to a human being are invisible. Like when you fell in love, could you see that? Could you measure that? When you fell in love, how do you know, and how does other people, and how do other people know that you fell in love? Uh, Churches, um, oh man, especially in the last few generations, the metrics of the church growth movement and, you know, how do we count, how do we count our church growing? Hey, by the way, this is like one of the final messages, uh, individual messages, Evan and I again next week and wrap things up together, but on on spiritual growth and we began uh, the message series saying, does everyone expect to grow? And we hope that we are all growing in the faith. Okay, measure that. Can you measure growth? Frankly and honestly, I can't see you growing. And you can't see me growing. It's invisible. I think churches ought to be very careful with our metrics, with the things we measure. Because churches can be full like whitewashed tombs of dead spiritual people who are not growing. Or churches could be amazingly powerful used of the Lord to advance His kingdom like with just a few people who turn the world upside down. You can't measure some of the most important things in your life. Let's get to those spiritual things. The most important things I believe that will ever happen to you are actually invisible. Like when were you born again? In a human way, we can't see that. When did God and His Spirit breathe new life into you? And by grace through faith, you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and your old self died, and your new self was born again. I was 22 years old and, and a day old in the same moment. And I was alone, and nobody saw it but God. See, some of the most important things that will ever happen to you are invisible. When were you convicted to repent of sin? When were you born again? When did you fall in love? Even when you said a marriage covenant to your spouse, if that's your situation in life where you're married, that's the visible part, but there had to be a time when it was an invisible commitment where you said, I love you and I want to love you forever. So there is something beautifully powerful about the way God has designed His church. And if there's a thesis in the message this morning, though the purpose of the message is to faithfully and obediently live out the gospel using the marks of God's true church, the thesis is this, and I'm borrowing it. I'm borrowing it from from Mark Deaver and uh, Jonathan Lehman and and their ministry. If you're not familiar with their ministry, it's the Nine Marks Ministry at Washington, D.C., Okay, Southern Baptist Church. But they got something right, which I think is profound and really simple, but profound found and gorgeous all at the same time. The church ought to be the gospel made visible. 
When the most important things that might ever happen to you as, as a person, and, and especially as a believer in Jesus Christ, are invisible, the church ought to be the place where those are made visible. Let me show you how that looks in Scripture. First of all, defining church. A true New Testament church is the gospel made visible. A true New Testament church is the gospel made visible. The first point. Um, the, the key passages, Jesus himself in the gospels, especially Matthew, uh, describing church. and It was the, the opening reading that we had from Matthew 16. And I want to point out some, some beautiful teachings here. Um, when Jesus says in Matthew 16, 15 to the disciples, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answers and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And by the way, I am using uh, different texts throughout Scripture today. Do have your Bibles open and follow along with me. It's important that you see what God is doing and creating and giving the church. And Jesus uh, said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. It's Matthew 16, 15 through 19. Man, we got to meditate on God's word better. You know what this passage says? The church is not a human institution. The church is created by God. Notice the verb used about the Father. When Jesus says to, to Simon Peter, Simon Barjona, Barjona is like son of, okay? Um, but it's, it's Simon Peter, Peter the Apostle. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. The confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, must have been given to you by the Father first. If you believe in Jesus Christ, it's because the Father drew you to Him to do so. Jesus then goes on to say, and, and it's, a, it's a beautiful play on words which uh, I would beg people to be very careful with. I say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. Some people interpret that to mean that upon Peter, Jesus will build his church. It's not what Jesus said. He used the word for small rock for Peter and upon the bedrock or foundation rock I will build my church. I believe the correct interpretation of this passage is upon the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the King, the Son of the living God which can only be revealed to you by the Father, I will build my church. So the Father reveals and the Son builds. This church, the true church of Jesus Christ is not a human organization. It is so powerful that the gates of Hades will not overpower it. It will outlast the gates of Hades. It will stand against Satan and his demons and all their schemes for eternity. Nothing will come against Christ's true church. The keys of the kingdom of heaven are given and whatever is bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever is loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. If I borrow then from Ephesians, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2.22, he describes this church of building of God as a dwelling of God in the Spirit. And in Ephesians 1.13, the Apostle Paul says that we are sealed with the Spirit. God the Father reveals it. Jesus the Son builds it. God the Holy Spirit seals it. The church is His. In Matthew 18, we have the church discipline section. Matthew 18, 15 and following, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. The purpose of true church discipline is winning. It's winning a brother. It's not punishment. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact can be 
or fact may be confirmed. I'm reading in Matthew 18, 17 and following. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, Jesus says in Matthew. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. See, that's a little bit of the binding and loosing. That's the power of the church, God's people, who are revealed unto by the Father, built by the Son, sealed by the Spirit, who are, who are helping to identify who is in the marks of a true church and who's not. And it is possible for an unrepentant person to be told, we do not recognize your salvation because you did not turn from your sin. We would rather you repent and turn. We would rather you receive Christ. We'd rather you stay in the true fellowship. But if you're unwilling to repent, you'll be loosed. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. That's verse 18 of Matthew 18. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Probably one of the most misquoted, misunderstood verses of the Bible. A lot of people say, well, wherever two or three are gathered, that's the church. It's not what this text is teaching. It's not what this text is teaching. This text is teaching biblical church discipline to help an errant, an errant believer turn from their sin so that their testimony of Christ is still good. And if the two or three are gathered... That mirrors, by the way, the two or three witnesses of verse 16, which is an Old Testament teaching that you, you, you cannot hold someone accountable or accuse them of anything wrong um, just by a single-handed witness. There has to be two or three real, actual witnesses. Okay? You can't just fabricate things and try to get away with it. So if in the church people say, No, that's not the way we live for God and Jesus Christ. That's not the true mark of a true church or a true Christian. If the person's unwilling to repent, they can be loosed. Biblical church discipline. And then you have in Matthew, notice I'm using, these are the key passages in church history that people have understood to be the foundational definitions of the church. From Jesus himself, Matthew 16, Matthew 18, Matthew 28, the Great Commission. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Peter would go on to say, in 1 Peter 2.9, referring to those who are in Christ, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim, you were purchased to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Here we begin to see from Jesus himself definitive teachings on who and what the church is. Jesus said in John 3, 3, I truly, truly, I say to you, he's speaking to Nicodemus in, in the chapter, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. A true church is made up of born again New Covenant Christians. You must be born again. Uh, when I was a brand new Christian, um, I was born and raised the first time uh, in Wisconsin. And I, I was 22 years old. I had no idea. I could not have told you the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, I thought, it, and the, now this is just me. I'm going to be very careful. This, is just, this was my opinion when I was a brand new Christian. I thought, well, I know that there's these Catholics and there's these Lutherans and then there's these born-again ones. And the born-again ones are like, Whoo! they're ah, they're crazy. They're the ones who, they really take it serious. I don't know. That was just my opinion. Come, come to read the Bible and find out that a born-again Christian is the only true Christian. Did you know that? Take your cultural Christianity and put it aside. What defines you as a Christian? The most important things that will ever happen to you in your life are invisible. Jesus said, unless one is born again, he cannot see 
cannot see, cannot enter. It's actually used twice in that chapter. The kingdom. So you could be, and let me pick on ourselves too. I'm going to throw this out there. You could be a Catholic and not be born again. You could be a Lutheran and not be born again. You could be a Baptist and not be born again. And none of them people are going to see the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ unless you're born again. You must be born again. Jesus said that. It's the only true Christian. And Christianity is made up of those who confess. In the opening reading from Matthew 10, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny also, also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. As Tony Evans famously once said, if your faith is so private, you know, does God even not know about it? Are you willing to stand not only in this building before a group of people and say unashamedly, I am a follower of Jesus Christ? But are you willing to go out in public and confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? To anybody and everybody, are you a confessing Christian? Are you a born-again Christian? Are you in the church of Jesus Christ, revealed unto by the Father, built by the Son, sealed by the Spirit? Are you a faithful, obedient Christian? These are the marks of a true church. Now, for, for this sake, I want to simply do a, a simple word definition of the word in your New Testament, ecclesia. Ecclesia is the word that we translate church. It literally translated means gathering. It is the gathering so no, you are not the church when you're out on the golf course playing by yourself because you're not gathered together with God's people. The church is the gathering of the redeemed for the purposes of the king. The church is the church when we are together. And this is where things begin to become more clear as I get into the second couple of points here this morning. Remember that the church is the gathering. Remember that some of the most important things that will ever happen to you are, are invisible. But how do we see them? Synonymously throughout Scripture, you have this concept of God's people, His people, referred to as His body, which is not just a New Testament teaching. That's also uh, Old Testament. As His church, as His bride, also an Old Testament teaching. God's people. One true people of God. Not two different people. There's only one God and one Lord of all. Christ is the head. To despise His church in any way betrays contempt for Christ Himself. But rather we should love what Jesus loves. So a definition for the local church would be this. As concisely as I can make it. A local Christian church is a body of baptized believers in Jesus Christ, regularly gathering for worship and discipleship, endeavoring to advance His gospel among all nations. They are united in the new covenant fulfilled in Jesus' death and resurrection. One in the Father, by the Holy Spirit, under biblical authority. Jesus is the head of his church, his bride. Its officers are elders and deacons. Believers identify with Christ and one another through immersion baptism and regular observance of the Lord's Supper, loving the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and their neighbor as themselves. Understanding how the one true God revealed His Father, Son, and Holy Spirit brings His people to salvation and identifies them together as His culminates in the doctrinal interdependencies of the priesthood of the believer and the equality and organization of the body of the church. Identity in Christ by His Spirit begets identity in Christ in His church and among His churches. And here it is. This invisible identity is made visible 
through the true marks of a church, especially the focus upon regenerate saving faith as seen in baptism and the Lord's Supper. There it is. This is how God designed in Scripture for the most amazing and most powerful spiritual things that will ever happen to you which are invisible. None of us in this room can actually look across the pew and say, I know you're saved. I can't see that. It's invisible. I don't know what you look like before Almighty God. That it, when God saves a soul and forgives you of your sin, that outlasts this life that is eternal. It's nothing like this world can see or measure. But then how can you see it? Well, guess what Jesus said? He said, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing. See, in the church, the marks of a true church are centered upon, as I've just defined church, the ecclesia, the gathering, revealed by the Father, built by the Son, sealed by the Spirit. As I define this church from Scripture, now let's do those two marks of a true church. I'm only going to do two today, not Mark Devers 9. What is it? It's baptism and the Lord's Supper. And in those ordinances, it is the invisible made visible. Can you see it? It's when a, a man and a woman have really sweet feelings for each other, but neither one of them knows yet, and then one of them endeavors to say those life-changing words, I love you, and they say them first to the other person, and the other person gets butterflies and goosebumps and has to decide, do I say it back? But you see, they fell in love before anybody said a word, and it was invisible. Jesus saves the human soul between him and you, and it's invisible to others. It's visible to God, don't get me wrong. But then, then, Jesus says, make them my disciples and baptize them. That's like the, I'm doing a loose metaphorical paraphrase, parable there. That's like when a husband and wife finally stand on the altar and they make vows to each other. And they now tell everyone and all the witnesses gathered, I love you, you love me, and we're making a covenant to be husband and wife. So you may be a Christian, but if you're not baptized, why haven't you told the world that you love Jesus? No. Why wouldn't you tell the world that you love Jesus? Because your invisible faith must have visible expression, and it's the marks of a true church. Edmund Clowney, yes, that's his name, in his book, The Church Contours of Christian Theology, identifies three marks of the Reformation distinguishing the true church of Christ. It's true preaching of the word, proper observance of the ordinances, that's Lord's Supper and baptism, and faithful exercise of church discipline. Clowney writes, yes, again, that's his name. I'm trying, I'm trying not to smile when I say his name, too. He's actually a theologian, and he's, he's, he's a well-respected uh, author on these things. Those who say that church membership is not necessary or even that it is unbiblical fail to grasp what the New Testament teaches about the church and the administration of the ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. If you think church membership is not necessary, you need to look at God again. You need to look at Jesus Christ again. You need to look at God the Father who reveals Christ the Son and Christ the Son who builds his church and the Holy Spirit that seals us into his dwelling place. You would be against the testimony of Scripture to say that membership is not necessary. Let me show you why. Connie goes on to write, baptism is recognized as a mark of membership in Christ's community. If the church is identified by the word and the ordinances, that's Lord's Supper and Baptism, church discipline uses the keys of the kingdom to maintain that identity, the binding and the loosing. The limitation of parachurch groups is that they lack some of the marks of the church. See, and that's where I, I want to be as gracious as I can be, but at the same time, I also want to 
call, a, call an error an error when I see it. I think there's an issue if people claim to be doing parachurch ministry. Like I, I knew of a ministry, I'm not going to name them. I knew of a ministry one time that said our whole ministry is built on making disciples. We make disciples, we teach the Bible, we make disciples. But do you do baptism? Well, no, we don't do baptism. Okay, wait, Jesus said in Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations, doing what? Baptizing them. So you're claiming to make disciples of Jesus while disobeying Jesus. What kind of disciples are those? There's a problem there, you see. Parachurch ministry, the only parachurch ministry that, that is, I, I would personally say, it's my opinion, that, that's somewhat acceptable is a ministry that feeds into the true church. <laughs> if it feeds into the true church and affirms that Jesus Christ said he would build his church and affirms biblical baptism and the Lord's Supper, that's good. But if a parachurch ministry says, well, this is our hobby horse, this is the thing we do, we don't do everything else, this is what we do, um, there's a reason why it's called a para-church. It means it's not a church. So to be a church, y'all, I want God's blessing on my life personally and on the life of any ministry that he calls me into. How can I possibly expect God to bless if from the same heart and the same mind and the same mouth I also intentionally disobey his commands? How's that possible? And I think the state of the modern church has gotten to that point where people love to take the name of Christ because they love the idea that Jesus said, I'll get saved and I'll go to heaven. And he'll forgive me of my sins. But then they don't want to do all the other things he commanded and all the other things he said. Right now, sitting together in this room, we have an opportunity to do an invisible commitment that no one else may ever see. And it's for your life personally. It could be for your marriage. It could be for your parenting. It could be for your membership in this church. But will you commit to being a follower of Christ and all of his teachings? Don't be Jefferson. The Jefferson Bible in Washington, D.C., where Thomas Jefferson ripped out different pages and cut out different sections of the Bible that he didn't like, he didn't accept. Most Christians still do that today. Will you make a faith-based commitment to the living God who created you and saved you and say, Lord, yes, I'll do it your way. I will follow what your word teaches. And don't take out pieces of it you don't like. Because if you do that, you are your own God. You're making a, an idol and a God of your own making. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Anytime, any person, you know, for the few years that we've been in ministry, I look at Pastor Evan there together, anytime any person comes with some excuse why they're not going to obey Jesus, you know how I actually personally feel? I'm going to tell you how Corey feels. That's between you and God. But you're not rejecting me. You're rejecting him. Why wouldn't you be baptized? Why wouldn't you join a church? Why wouldn't you celebrate the Lord's Supper as he teaches it? Because those are the marks of a true Christian church. To faithfully and obediently live out the gospel using the marks of God's true church, let's get into baptism. Believer's baptism, the visible covenant sign of knowing Christ and being in his body. Uh, there's more than, than the single passages I'm sharing with you, but there's the key passages. Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, 1 and following reads, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism 
into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Again, I don't think you can separate. We like to, as Westerners, we try to make it a thing, like it's like as if it's a categor- categorical differentiation or definition. You cannot separate the invisible from the visible here. Okay? See, the visible aspect of immersion baptism, that the word baptism means to immerse, to go underwater, there's actually a word used um, in the first century to also describe a ship that was sinking under, went under. If you've been baptized into Christ Jesus, you've been baptized into his death, you're buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Baptism is a God-given ordinance in the new covenant by which you have aligned yourself with Jesus Christ. You are identifying yourself with him and his people. Baptism is not just individualistic. It's also corporate. A lot of people argue, well, okay, show me membership in the Bible and I'll join the church. It's baptism. Baptism was the new covenant sign that a person had followed the Messiah. Jesus. The blood of the Lamb. The new covenant of God to save his people from their sin and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you, by grace through faith, receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then be baptized. The entire book of Acts, read the whole book of Acts from beginning to end, and you will see a constant, beautiful testimony in the book of Acts. I mean, it, one of the first pictures is, is uh, Peter on the day of Pentecost preaching to thousands of people gathered there, and they're pierced to the heart when he proclaims the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is now Lord, and he proclaims it to them, and, and, and they gather together, and they say, brothers, what shall we do? We're pierced to the heart. They come to Peter, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You will always see the gospel proclaimed People responding to the gospel, and then once they've received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they're baptized in the book of Acts. Friends, if you think baptism is a non-issue, that's not biblical Christianity. Baptism is a sign of the true church. And if you've become a believer in Jesus Christ, confess him as Lord before people and be baptized as he instructed and follow him. How could you be expected to follow all the other commands and teachings? Okay, think again about the, the pattern of the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. How can a person be taught to observe all the other teachings of Jesus Christ if they didn't observe the very first teaching of Jesus Christ, which was to be baptized? That's hypocritical, and that's not New Testament Christianity. I've shared on baptism from the Bible many, many times, and I'm still waiting for some people to say, I will confess Christ publicly. And in doing so, in that very baptism event, you are also then joining the church that identifies you with Christ and with his people. We believe that anyone who has personally responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ through repentance from sin and faith in him alone for salvation must then be baptized by immersion according to Scripture. Through baptism, the person symbolizes his or her faith in the crucified, buried, and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, as well as his or her own death to sin, burial of the old life, and resurrection to walk in newness of life following Christ as his disciple. By faithful obedience to Christ's command to be baptized, a person is both testifying and surrendering to two aspects of their spiritual identity, that spiritual invisible thing that they're now making visible. First, a believer's water baptism by immersion in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit visibly professes one's personal saving union with Jesus Christ. Second, 
At the same time and in the same event, baptism also admits that person into the church of Jesus Christ as a member of the body. Baptism incorporates both a spiritual blessing and a holy responsibility to identify personally with Christ and unite corporately with his church. Remember, church is the gathering, the ecclesia. Only born-again believers are to be baptized. You will find no instance in your entire Bible where an infant is baptized. We do not baptize infants. We baptize people who have done what Jesus said. If you confess me before my Father, I'll confess you. If you confess me before the world, I'll confess you before my Father. So we believe in confession, proclaiming Christ. Believer's baptism is the new covenant sign signifying a person's union with Jesus Christ and his people, the church. Baptism is the person's entry into visible membership in the family of God, his living temple. Therefore, God has designed it so that regeneration, the invisible aspect of salvation, and church membership, the visible aspect of identifying with Christ and his people and salvation, actually go together. Thus, the act of baptism is a person's way to acknowledge once for all both personal and corporate new life in Jesus Christ. You're sharing your testimony and you're joining the family of God. That's biblical New Testament church membership. Okay, we've talked about what a true New Testament church is. It's the gospel made visible. We've talked about believer's baptism, the visible covenant sign of knowing Christ and being in his body. And then let, let's, let's round out with um, the Lord's Supper, the visible renewal sign of Christ's people. The cup of the new covenant in Christ's blood is what he calls it in Luke 22, 20 and 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five. It's the cup of the new covenant in Christ's blood. Baptized believers are celebrating salvation past, present, and future when they have the Lord's Supper together. Um, we, we get this especially from uh, the Gospels. Uh, the night before Jesus was crucified, he had the Passover with his disciples, and he instituted the Lord's Supper there. And we also get it from 1 Corinthians 11. And I want to share a little bit of background and get into 1 Corinthians 11 a little bit, and then we're going we're gonna to wrap this all up. Y'all need, you need a brain break to wrap this up? I know when I say we're going to wrap this up, you're going to be like, what? So a pastor was 10 minutes into his sermon when he noticed his young son in the balcony with a pea shooter. He was leaning over the bal- balcony, aiming and popping people in the head as the pastor prepared to deliver a very public scolding rebuke of his son. The seven-year-old hollered out, you keep preaching, Dad, and I'll keep him awake. Watch out, there's people in the room right now with straws. Really? I have friends in high places. Here we go. And she's a Marine, so watch out. This is really cool. In 1 Corinthians 11, you see Paul is dealing with a problem in the Corinthian church of division. Uh, in 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen, 16, if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God, one of the references to the churches, the gatherings of God's people. Uh, but in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, he says to the Corinthians, I'm reading in 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen, 17, uh, because you come together not for better, but for worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, a gathering, come together, okay? I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved uh, may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. See, some people say, why do you call it the Lord's Supper at your church, at First Baptist? Uh, Because the word communion is not in Scripture, and and the word Lord's Supper is. So we call it the Lord's Supper here, because we're following Scripture. Paul is criticizing them, saying, though, uh, in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and the other is drunk? What? That, That wasn't me. That was the exclamation point in verse 22. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? 
What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. So actually it's in a context of rebuke where Paul is teaching the Corinthian church about the Lord's Supper and he's actually shaming them. I think it's biblical to use shame appropriately and carefully and graciously. But this is why we can actually stand here today and say, do not think so little of the Lord's church which he purchased with his blood. Do not diminish the identity of his church and do not diminish the importance of baptism and do not diminish the importance of the Lord's supper. Because these things define who we are as we are related to and believers in Jesus Christ himself. Then Paul goes on to write, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this drink, excuse me, eat this bread and drink this cup. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Did you hear that? The Lord's death until he comes. So here's something that's phenomenal as we wrap this up. In both ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, the gospel of Jesus Christ is being proclaimed to the church and to the world. Did you see it? Because when we do believers' baptism and people go under the water and they're raised to new life in Christ and we're following what Romans 6 says, that demonstrates just, uh, just like Christ died and was buried in the tomb and rose again, and it demonstrates our union with him. And when we do the Lord's Supper together and we remember his body broken for us and his blood spilt for us, the blood of the new covenant, it's a covenant that God made with you to save you eternally. And we're going to remember what he did in the past. We remember it in the present right now. And he's going to return in the future. It's past, present, and future salvation. In baptism and the Lord's Supper, we are always consistently proclaiming the gospel. That is a true New Testament church. That's a true New Testament church. The Lord's Supper is a symbolic act of faithful remembrance whereby Members of the church, through partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine, memorialize the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and anticipate his return. Jesus himself, on the night before he was crucified, instituted the Lord's Supper as a memorial feast to be celebrated by his new covenant people. The Lord's Supper is the regular corporate remembrance of Jesus Christ's body and blood being broken and shed for our sin. The Lord's Supper is the new covenant fulfillment of the Passover pointing to the past, present, and future realities of salvation, the salvation of God's people, and the sacrifice and sure return of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. The church is to regularly practice the Lord's Supper. As baptism is the new covenant sign of initiation by which a person is admitted into the community of Christ, so the Lord's Supper is the renewal sign of remembrance and recommitment to Christ and his people. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are the ordinances of being admitted to and continuing in the fellowship of the body of Christ, the church. As baptism has replaced the Old Testament bloody rite of circumcision, so the Lord's Supper has replaced the bloody Passover lamb. And in both, the gospel is being proclaimed. These are the marks of a true New Testament church. The three key ones, and of course others have more. Mark Deaver has nine. (laughs) The three key ones are the preaching of God's word and the correct celebration of the ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, and church discipline. Where are we going from here? Point number four, glorifying Christ in worship, discipleship, and mission. This is a foretaste of God's blessing here at First Baptist Church. And I'm not going to preach this point because Evan and I are going to talk about this in the next couple of weeks. But here's where we're going. We believe that more and more God is blessing us to be more and more faithful to his word and to call God's people to faithful obedience to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through baptism and church membership and the Lord's Supper. And if you say no to these things, be careful that you are not belittling 
the church for which he shed his blood. We want to worship God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in spirit and in truth according to John 4, 23 through 24. We want to disciple one another to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ as in John 8, 31 and 32. We want to be on mission for the gospel of Jesus Christ to all nations according to the Great Commission. And here's the thing. Is that the last slide? Can you please go up to the very first one that had the mess that all the messages listed on it for me? I'm throwing her a curveball. I appreciate your help. Here's the thing. You see, marks of a New Testament church, that's our testimony to the world of what it's like to be a Christian. So you can't just be a Christian and lone ranger by yourself. Will you join God's true church? By confessing Christ before people, first of all, you must be born again. You must receive him as your Lord and Savior. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Do you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? Have you personally prayed to Jesus to forgive you of your sins? Are you a born again Christian? Then be baptized. Now, if you've already been baptized, we don't have to rebaptize you. But you can come forward and confess Christ before the body and say, I'm a born again baptized believer and I want to join the membership of this church. Why? To glorify Christ and worship discipleship and mission, to advance the gospel in the world. So you see, the marks of a true church should actually also become the marks of a true Christian. Did you hear it? A true Christian is born again. A true Christian confesses Christ. A true Christian is baptized and a member of a true church. A true Christian regularly gathers to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And a true Christian is used of God to advance his gospel in this world. You're his disciple. If you're missing any one of those factors in your walk with Christ, it's time to align your life with his. Come to Christ today. Be baptized if you haven't been. Join the church, grow in Christ, and let God use you to take his gospel to the nations. Lord Jesus, I pray that you help us to be that which only you can make us be. No human being can make a church, not one that's true. The true church of Jesus Christ is revealed by the Father, built by Jesus, sealed by the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, all arrogance would be done away with and pride would be done away with. There is no human pride in this statement. And at the same time, we must long to be your true church, that we would not be anything false or fake or insincere or wrong or worldly or selfish. But Jesus, that you would have your way with us. Call us to be what you want us to be as your body visibly representing the love of Jesus Christ in this world. And if there's anyone here who has not yet received you as Lord and Savior, Holy Spirit, draw them even now with your love to believe in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sin and rose again from the dead. All who believe in Jesus Christ are forgiven of sin and have eternal life. In your name I pray, amen.